approximately 60 minutes. You are required to, to stay for the entire process. If by chance you have to leave this presentation, there is an opportunity tomorrow at 9 o'clock to review a screen uh, recording of this. So please stay for the entire presentation so that we can meet our mandate on this guideline from ADA. There will be an opportunity for you also to ask questions. So if you have questions, please go ahead and think about those questions and put them together because there will be an opportunity for you to ask those questions. Now on behalf of the president who is traveling back from Chicago, it's really cold up there where you are. <laughs> he wanted me to uh, send you all his greetings and, you, and his thanks for your participation in this process and everything that you are doing at this particular time and in this season. He knows that this is a very important time for us and all of our students. We're at the end of the term. We got many things happening. We got verification going on, getting final examinations ready. So thank you all for coming out and making sure that college meets its mandatory requirement on this activity. So if there are no questions for me at this time, let me go ahead and uh, introduce the presenters. I'm going to give them an opportunity to present their own information, their own CV, because both of them have many titles. You all are familiar with probably both of them. Uh, Attorney Wendy Blitz, Blitzer is from Hen, Aaron Dahl, and Harris. And of course, our own Andrea Agnew, Dr. Agnew, is a, a uh, adjunct of Bishop State Community College. And as they come up, they'll give you a little bit more information about themselves. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. It's good to see you. Uh, my name is Wendy Porter, and I'm an attorney at the Air Doc firm here in Mobile. Uh, it's been my pleasure to work with the college for the last number of years and to present um, a, a number of times at your professional development sessions on various things. And I'm very pleased today to be able to present with Dr. Andrea Agnew, who is, uh, I'm sure most of you all know, has been an adjunct professor here for about 19 years, I understand. And she is also really an expert in ADA uh, student um, accommodations and in her role at the University of South Alabama. And she'll tell you a little bit more about that. But um, Dr. Agnew and I have had a chance to um, present together before at uh, other institutions on um, student disability training. And um, it's just it's always great to present with somebody who has such um, vast knowledge and, and the practical implications. So she'll serve as a great resource um, for you today as well, I know. Um, Dr. Ackman and I have been asked to provide training to you all today on the college's obligations under federal law to provide reasonable accommodations to students with uh, registered disabilities so that all students are given equal access to educational opportunities. And we're going to discuss today the proper process for responding to a request for accommodations that um, students may bring to you. Um, this is an important topic, um, and even if you have received the ADA student disability training in the past, I hope that this will benefit you and be a good refresher for you. As uh, Mr. McSwain said, this is a mandatory training session. It is being required Bishop State by the Department of Education Office of Civil Rights. So please do be sure to sign in if you haven't already. We will be um, submitting the actual sign-in sheets to the Department of Ed. Um, and so we have to have all of the faculty members' attendance reported. All right. Let's um, talk about what we're going to talk about today. And that is... Um, um, during today's training regarding student disabilities, we're going to talk about what the applicable law is. And that's really going to be my portion of the discussions today. Um, and what it requires of both the college and of the students who have the disabilities. We're also going to discuss the college's policies and <coughs> procedures. And for your reference, um, in case you haven't seen it recently, there is an ADA Student Services Handbook that is available on the Bishop State website on the, on the front page of the website. Um, so that's available as an available resource for you as well. We're going to talk about the college's ADA resources. Um, and if you take nothing else 
from today's session. The one takeaway I hope that you will remember as faculty members of this institution uh, is that you have a great resource uh, to address any student disability issues that may come your way through your ADA advisor office and student services. And the director of that um, uh, area is Ms. Latasha P. Ryan. She's here with us today. I uh, hope all of you have met her. If you haven't met her yet, please take the opportunity to meet her and become familiar with her. Um, and just know that she is here to be a resource, an advocate for students, but also to be a resource for each of you as faculty members. And so, should you encounter any questions about accommodations for students with disabilities, she should be the person that you contact right away. Don't think you're in this alone. You have a resource, and she has resources beyond herself that she can reach out to, you know, both publications and other peers, that she can reach out to help find the answers and, and find the solutions to any situation that you may have. So, uh, don't think you're in this alone. You've got the resources, so please, please do use them. Um, and she is here, obviously, to partner with you and to serve the students and to ultimately ensure that the college's obligations are satisfied. So please do use that resource. As a final note, I will say with respect to that, the resource, should you not be able to reach Ms. Brun um, on a particular instance, perhaps you sick one day and there is an emergent need, realize this is a college-wide obligation. And so if she hasn't left directions on her email or her phone on whom you might need to consult in her absence, I hope that she will do that. But if she hasn't and you've just been unable to reach her and you have an emergent situation, I highly recommend that you go to um, Dr. Hazard right away. He knows and understands the importance of these issues. And one of the college's obligations is to timely respond to student disability issues. So in the event that you're unable to reach her right away, then know that you can, can reach out to Dr. Hazard because he also understands the importance uh, of satisfying the college's obligations. Okay, so let's talk about um, the two federal laws that, uh, the applicable laws, and there are two primarily. The first is Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act, and the second is Title II of the Americans with Disabilities Law. Title II of the Americans with Disabilities Act, sorry. The, um, there's a quote from Section 504 that uh, summarizes well what both of the laws really require, and that is that no otherwise qualified individual with a disability shall solely by reason of his or her disability be excluded from participation in, but not be denied the benefits of, or be subjected to discrimination under any program or activity receiving federal financial assistance. The purpose of these two laws is virtually the same, um, which prohibits discrimination on the basis of disability. And there really is little, if any, practical difference between the two laws. And so they're very often referred to together. So if you read materials about student disabilities and applicable law, you'll, also, you'll, you'll frequently see Section 504 slash Title II, and <laughs> that's how they generally refer to them. Now, Section 504 applies to schools who receive federal financial assistance, and Bishop State does, so Section 504 applies to the college. And Title II of the ADA extends these disability protections to all public entities, including state institutions of higher learning like Bishop State. So both of these laws are applicable. When enacting these laws, Congress, as it typically does, gathered data to support the passage of legislation, uh, and they made these findings, that millions of Americans have one or more physical or mental disabilities and the number is increasing. Individuals with disabilities constitute one of the most disadvantaged groups in society. Disability is a natural part of the human experience and in no way diminishes the right of individuals to, among other things, make choices, contribute to society, pursue meaningful careers, and enjoy full inclusion and integration in the educational mainstream of American society. Congress also articulated <coughs> the purpose for enacting these laws, which include, among other things, to empower disabled individuals to maximize their employment economic self-sufficiency, independence, inclusion, and integration into society. There's also one of the purposes is to ensure that students with disabilities have opportunities for post-secondary success. So who is a qualified individual with a disability? 
for post-secondary education purposes, this means that a student meets the academic and technical standards that are required for participation in the class or program or activity, that student has a physical or mental impairment that limits one or more of their major life activities. And major life activities include, for example, seeing, hearing, walking, or speaking, and also include school-related tasks um, that may involve learning, concentrating, thinking, and communicating. So under these laws, what is required of students with disabilities when they come to a covered institution? Well, these students must meet the college's standard admissions requirements for all students. A college cannot deny admission to a student just because they have a disability. But the college's requirements for admission, let's say a particular minimum GPA or an ACP test score, those requirements need not be lowered. Students also must disclose their disabilities and initiate the disability services to receive accommodations. Now, at the post-secondary level, a student with a disability is not required to disclose that they have a disability. <coughs> but if they have a disability and want accommodations, then they, it is their obligation to initiate that process. Students must provide documentation of their substantial function, uh, functional limitations in order to determine whether they qualify for those services. And students have to engage in self-regulated learning. They're not entitled to the same level of support that they uh, perhaps receive during elementary, middle, and high school. Students, again, must meet minimal of the they must meet the college's essential requirements for a particular course or program, either with or without the uh, accommodation. This is not about lowering academic standards. It's about leveling the playing field. So what do these laws require of the college? The college is required to make reasonable accommodations in its practices, policies, procedures, and to provide auxiliary aids and services with disabilities unless doing so would fundamentally alter the nature of the goods, services, facilities, privileges, advantages they offer, or if it would result in an undue financial or administrative burden on the institution. So in other words, the college has to, the college is required to provide appropriate academic adjustments and services where it's necessary that the participants with disabilities have an equal opportunity to participate in the college's program and services unless doing so would fundamentally change the essential requirements of the program. So again, it's leveling the playing field in terms of access to the services um, and opportunities of the college. It, again, it requires access and opportunity. It doesn't guarantee success necessarily, but it gives them the ability then to succeed if they're able to accomplish the academic object objectives in that class. And each student has to be accommodated, each student with a disability must be accommodated on a course-by-course -course and case-by-case -case basis. <coughs> the college is not required to, nor should it, compromise a course's essential requirements. And the objective of the academic adjustments is always to accommodate the disability and not to dilute the scholastic requirements. So for an example, the college may be provided, may be required, for example, and, and some of you probably um, are very familiar with this sort of scenario. You may be required to provide extended testing time for a student with a registered disability and with the approved accommodations but you're not required to change the substantive content of the examination that that student then takes. And that's, the substantive conduct is what it, or content is what is used to measure the learning outcome. So, when faced with a request for accommodations by a student, the college has to assess whether an accommodation requested for a particular class or program would fundamentally alter the essential requirements of that course or program. And again, those are essential learning outcomes which are fundamental 
fundamental to a course or program that have to be demonstrated by all students with or without accommodations. And if you exclude any of those outcomes, let's say the student has to learn how to do a certain type of math problem, but if you don't allow or don't require that student to meet that outcome, but you require the non-disabled students to do that, that's that's a disadvantage to the non-disabled student. So this again is just leveling the playing field so that everyone has the same opportunity and the essential outcomes are the same. Uh, and if you are concerned that an accommodation that's been requested is going to change the fundamental learning outcome, then you're not required to uh, grant that accommodation. And that is something that you would need to discuss directly with um, Ms. P. Ryan to see um, and make an assessment about. And Dr. Agnew will talk a little bit later about how the college would go about in making a determination on whether there is an, uh, the, the, the um, uh, issue is uh, a matter of a changing of the fundamental outcome. Now, there are lots of different types of disabilities. Um, you know, when you get a form from the Disability Services Office that requires you as a faculty member to provide accommodation, you will not be provided a diagnosis of that particular student. Um, the ADA office is the office that sees the medical documentation and they verify it. That's confidential <coughs> medical information and you as faculty members, if a, a student, you know, personally discloses to you, you know, that's one thing. But you should not ask for nor expect to receive the medical uh, documentation yourself or make inquiries of the student about the, this, their specific disability. Um, again, there are lots of different types of disabilities. Um, there are medical disabilities, asthma, diabetes, that have a student with cancer. There are psychological disabilities that may have to be accommodated. Individuals with anxiety disorder, depression, your learning disabilities that a number of your students may face, or neurological impairments such as ADD and ADHD, which I know a lot of you perhaps have seen a, a dramatic increase over the last uh, 10 or more years or so. There are other more traditional uh, sort of disabilities that people think of when you talk about accommodating disabilities. You know, if you have a student who's deaf or otherwise hard of hearing, um, you can have blind students or visu otherwise visually impaired. Uh, there could be mobility concerns um, if someone uses a wheelchair. And also, uh, disabilities can be temporary. They don't have to be long-term chronic conditions. They can be short-term, and those would need to be accommodated as well. So in a situation, if you have a student with that who's in a wheelchair, and let's say the elevator is broken in one of the buildings, and the class is otherwise scheduled to occur on the second floor, well, an obvious accommodation would be move the class. <laughs> so that the student can attend. And that's an, you know, an open and obvious thing that can be easily fixed. Um, you know, it's some of the other ones that are a little uh, more personal and in, in nature, an anxiety disorder or an ADHD that you have to figure out, okay, what's the appropriate accommodation? And that's where working together with your ADA advisor will help uh, and determine what a particular student needs for a particular um, class and situation. Let's take the example of a student who has an oral disability. Let's say they have auditory uh, processing disorder, and this is a type of learning disorder which is characterized as a weakness in ability to understand and process auditory information, and it can affect their ability to spell, read, write, and understand. So here's some, just some possible uh, accommodations um, for uh, auditory processing disorder. And again, this is, there's no one size fits all. It has to be analyzed on a case-by-case -case basis. But here are some things that you could expect to um, see in terms of accommodations um, for a uh, student with this sort of disability. <coughs> Providing them with assistive listening devices. Allowing preferential um, seating. Providing materials in alternative formats, sometimes in advance of class. Allowing recording of lectures. Uh, or allowing written communication. Some other common accommodations, just more generally for students with disabilities, are providing architectural access. Again, the situation with a student in a wheelchair, for example, and you need to make sure that they're able to come into the classroom that's been designated in the building, uh, that they've been designated to participate uh, in the class for which they're participating. 
um, they may need to be provided note takers or allow them to take, take, um, take lectures. There may be assistive technology that needs to be provided um, to these students. Um, I know on occasion in the past you've had interpreters um, for deaf students uh, in some of your classes. So those are, that's another example of an accommodation. Um, providing distraction reduced and extending uh, testing for students. A priority registration. Uh, attendance modifications, and also exceptions to blanket policies that you might otherwise have in your syllabuses. On these last two, let me comment that I'm aware that faculty may include in a course syllabus a number of class rules and requirements, and for which you may say there is a no exception or zero, um, zero tolerance policy for exceptions. For example, let's say you've got a blanket policy that you don't allow any makeup exams. You need to be aware that even though you include that in your syllabus, you also have an ADA statement in your syllabus as well. And recognize that such hard and fast rules may not be appropriate in certain circumstances for students with disabilities. And you may have to make an exception to your own non-exception approval <laughs> policy when you have a situation who, uh, with it, when you have a student who has a registered disability. So in that instance, for example, let's say you have a student who has cancer um, or has another chronic medical situation and they actually may need to legit make up an examination because of the treatment situation they're undergoing. Those are accommodations that need to be discussed and most likely accommodated and, and provided, um, and they certainly need to be considered and discussed with your ADA advisor before you say no. <clears throat> Again, if you have any concern about the provision of accommodations that, um, that, that you're being asked to provide and its impact on the classwork and the outcome, learning outcomes that you expect of your students, you really do need to talk and work with Ms. P. Ryan to ensure that there is an appropriate response coming from the college. I'm going to turn it over. Oh, not yet. I've got one more slide. Sorry. Um, let me give you just a couple of tips that I have. Um, remember that this is a college-wide obligation. And I mentioned this when we gave um, training to the student services staff earlier this week. Remember to assist others and back each other up to ensure that student disability needs and accommodations are timely given and appropriately addressed. The same can be said uh, with all of you, and as Dr. Agnew goes through some examples, if a student comes to you and they don't know anything about the Student Disability Services Office, but they approach you and say, I need some help, I used to get, you know, one-on-one uh, -on -one individual assessments <laughs> coming up through my uh, younger education days, and I'm really struggling. Well, you know, the recommendation would be immediately, don't dilly-dally about it, immediately refer them to um, Ms. P. Ryan and the ADA office. And if you haven't heard anything back from them, contact her <coughs> and ask if she's heard about that. But keep the process rolling. The last thing we want is one of these sort of situations to fall through the cracks. Um, you're all on the same team. <laughs> the whole objective is to help and educate students and so if you work together to make sure everybody gets the services, services they need and in a timely fashion, um, that's really um, a, a bit of advice I, I hope that you'll take to heart. Also, don't make assumptions about a student's abilities or disabilities um, unless they talk to you about that. If you have some concern about a student's um, behaviors or if they're having some um, uh, difficulty in your class, don't say, uh, hey, have you ever been tested for ADD or ADHD? That's really an inappropriate conversation for you to have as a faculty member with the student. You can perhaps refer them to other sources at the college, including the ADA office, but you might mention some other things as well, the learning lab and that sort of thing that wouldn't target them and say, oh, I bet you've got a disability. So just keep that in mind. And also, again, remember that you have an obligation to respect confidentiality. So if you do learn of a student's particular disability, that's not something that you need to go around and talk about. I mean, that is confidential. 
uh, information. And again, this B Rounds office is really the only one that would see the actual uh, documentation um, from a healthcare provider. So uh, remember that um, you know you, you need to keep that confidential. And if my final word, which was my first word, was engage with the ABA advisor on campus. Um, with any concerns that you have, particularly in the administration of the reasonable accommodations that you're asked to provide. All right, now I'm going to turn it over to uh, Dr. Agnew. Thank you, Wendy. Good afternoon, faculty, friends. So good to see you all. Um, <clears throat> I serve the University of South Alabama as assistant dean of students. And in that capacity, I oversee a couple of programs, Upward Bound, Educational Talent Search, uh, Student Conduct, but the bulk of my responsibilities are geared toward ADA compliance for our institution. Our campus is large, so we have over 700 students who are registered with a disability. And that cuts across uh, undergraduate programs, graduate programs, colleges of nursing, medicine, we even have the Auburn Harrison School of Pharmacy on our campus and we provide reasonable accommodations for those students as well. I even brought a staff member with me today, Mr. Leventris Ridgeway, who helps me with uh, our work. The, most of the time, I am talking to folks like you, full-time faculty. I'm engaged in troubleshooting as opposed to direct contact with students. So let's talk a little bit about Bishop State's ADA office. Again, your BFF on this campus, if you have a student with a disability, is going to be Ms. Latasha Pirot. She is chomping at the bit and waiting to hear from you to help you resolve an issue. So what she does and what this office does is to ensure access. As uh, my co-presenter Wendy mentioned, access is our key, not success. We just have to level the playing field to make sure that it is equitable for all parties. So, Ms. Piron's office also will protect students from discrimination and protect the confidentiality of registered students. It's sometimes difficult to get students to register um, with the office because they think that we're going to put their diagnosis on the letter that goes to faculty. So we assure them, or need to assure them, that it's only going to have those accommodations. She will also determine the most appropriate academic accommodations that do not compromise program standards. And if it's a difficult uh, case, she'll likely consult with you or a department chair or division head to ensure that the student's uh, ADA compliance obligation has been met. Ultimately, we want to empower all of our students towards self-advocacy, and she is also going to be your campus resource, and will also assist faculty, students, staff, etc. Again, you can find the college policies. They're publicly available on the website in a nice, easy-to-read handbook. You can point your students to the handbook. You can send them a link to it via Canvas so that they can become aware of the policies. <clears throat> so what does this mean for faculty and staff? Ultimately, ADA compliance rests on your shoulders. Once you receive the letter, it's your obligation to ensure that your course is ADA compliant. And you do that by following the letter of the law, so to speak, which Ms. P. Ryan will send to you. So, <clears throat> if a student comes to you, just like Ms. Uh, Wendy mentioned, and says, you know, I need this extra thing to be successful in your class, and it sounds like an accommodation, and that student has not brought you a letter, then refer them to your best friend, Ms. P. Ryan, so that they can get what they need taken care of. Also, the easiest, quickest way to refer a student is to ensure that your syllabus has an ADA statement on it directing those who need assistance or have a disability to Ms. P. Ryan. So, your other obligations. You are going to ensure
ensure that these accommodations are provided to students in a timely and responsive manner. If you need assistance or have difficulty, don't sit and wait. Pick up the phone, send an email, ask questions. Um, something that you also need to know too is that though they may ask, they being the students, accommodations are not applied retroactively. So today is December the 6th. Anybody still giving final exams? Okay. All right. So let's say a student brought you their letter today. What's your obligation? Today forward. Okay. Again, let me say that again. Today forward. We don't get in the way back machine and go all the way back to August or September and allow them to have extra time or whatever is written on their letter. They are not applied retroactively. Uh, on our campus, we view retroactive accommodations the same way we do Bigfoot, unicorns, <laughs> Easter bunnies, and Santa Claus. They don't exist. So it's from the point of notification forward. All right. And again, problem solving is what we in this business do. As a matter of fact, last year my office had over 2,600 faculty consults. Faculty consults. Okay. All right. And again, this is where your BFF is located. So, Ms. Piron is located in the Del Champs building uh, on the main campus. She's real easy to find. And some of the services that her office provides are testing accommodations. She has a small testing center over there, so if you have someone who needs a scribe, a, a reader, or extended time in some way, she can do that over there in her small testing center. She can also ensure that students who perhaps are low vision have access to adaptive technology. She can work with uh, accessible formats for course materials. Uh, do you all have any totally blind students here on campus? Okay, we have a few. Anyone in here teach math? There you are. Right. Question for you. How much does a Royal Calculus book cost? No idea. $60,000. <laughs> she can help you coordinate that. <laughs> All right. Is that, that comes from a budget that's a little bit different than what your department might have. Twice as bad. Be surprised at the cost of some of this stuff. Um, her office also helps to coordinate um, interpreters. So interpreters come in a lot of different varieties. You know, today's kid doesn't want a whole person in front of them doing some sign language. They're a little bit more discreet, so they use captioning. So they're sitting there with their iPads, you might not even know this person is deaf, and they're getting a real-time captioning of everything that's being said in your classroom. How much does that cost? Yeah, exactly. About $9 an hour. That doesn't necessarily come out of your department budget. It comes from somewhere more likely first. Okay. All right, so we've used the word reasonable a lot today. So let's talk about what's unreasonable. Because you will get requests, and she'll get requests, we get requests for things that are unreasonable. So I want to make sure that you know what unreasonable means in the context of accommodations. So if the accommodation would give them an unfair advantage or a disadvantage to a student with a disability, then we would call that unreasonable. I'll give you an example. Um, we had a request for a student, from a student who wanted to be given a retake the exact same test over and over until they got passing grade. Okay. Reasonable or unreasonable? Unreasonable. Yeah. You're like, I got that one too. 
<laughs> All right, retroactive accommodations, as I've already mentioned, these two are considered to be unreasonable. And also, accommodations that prevent the student from learning or mastering a skill or concept that's expected of other students. I used the example previously uh, with the other group. I don't know a whole lot of technical programs, but let's say that someone has to draw blood. Okay, uh, does anybody teach a class where people have to draw blood? No nursing people here? Okay. You don't do that? That's not old school. All right. Okay. All right, just roll with me for the example purposes. All right. So let's say that you told the disabled student to just watch the other students do it. You didn't make them do it. Then we can't really assess their mastery of that skill. Mm -hmm. So that is something that would certainly be unreasonable. There are a couple of asterisks down here on this last one. Uh, something that's unreasonable would pose an undue burden, financial or administrative, on the college. Now there's a heavy burden of proof to, to do this, uh, to say that it's a, a burden. Because when I mentioned the $60,000 calculus book, mm -hmm. y'all, I, I felt the blood pressure in the room go up a little bit. So while that nearly breaks the bank in my office, I can't say that that's an undue burden for us because the courts and the Office for Civil Rights looks at the totality of the University of South Alabama's operating budget, which is over a billion dollars. So they will say, $60,000 book, please, miss us with that. So again, and I'm dropping these reasonable accommodations that I have, these glasses. So again, it's not an undue financial or administrative burden on the college. So they look at the entire college, not just one department's budget or one division's budget. All right, so how do we do it? How do we determine and provide academic adjustments and auxiliary aids and accommodations? Well, the student comes on campus and must first self-identify. So that means that they say, hey, I'm a student with a disability. Here's my documentation, which is proof that I have this disability. I'm in need of services. So that's the first step. They fill out the form, the application in the ADA office, and they are individually assessed. So Ms. P. Ryan conducts an individualized assessment to determine what is the most appropriate accommodation for the student based on their class schedule and the program that they have. Now, we are required, if we're doing this kind of work, to engage with the student and do an individualized assessment. So it must be individualized and we show proof of that. We also have to show proof that the student was actively engaged in the process. So the process must be interactive in nature. We can't just look at documentation render a, a decision concerning it, we have to engage the student. And so what we're looking for when we're talking to the student is what are their abilities? What are their skills? What are their functional limitations? How are they impacted um, on a major life activity? How is the nature of their issue, how does it manifest in the classroom setting? And again, you don't have to do any sort of interpretation. Ms. P. Ryan gives you a letter that states that the student needs X, Y, Z uh, accommodation. It's all laid out for you. Okay. So, and you are going to provide these in a timely fashion. So, timely fashion. We're expecting, you know, as soon as you get the letter, try to schedule an opportunity to talk with the student to find out, you know, a little bit more about when they want to take the test, how they want to take the test, 
and the implementation of their accommodations. All right, now here are a few additional responsibilities that you as faculty members have. Now, some of you are, are super nice. <laughs> You're kind and generous. I, I've heard my students say very positive things about you. You're just nice people in general. You may want to give them more than what's on the letter. So we don't ask that you give them more unless the whole class gets it too. Okay? Because you're, you're going to be out of compliance if you're just giving this, this one particular student all this extra stuff that's not on the letter. So make sure that you give that to all the students. Okay? You promise? Okay. All right, and again, if there are any concerns that you have about the implementation of the accommodations, talk to the ADA advisor as quickly as you can. <coughs> if the student requests accommodations and they have not brought you a letter, what are you going to do? You're going to refer them to the ADA office. And again, do not at the request of the student lower, lower the expectations of the course. You know, don't fundamentally alter the nature of your course at the request of the student. That's not, that's not the intent of accommodations. As we said, it's not to guarantee access, uh, success, but to guarantee access. And again, if there are issues that need troubleshooting, refer them to Ms. Piri. So, how and when and how to refer the student. All right, so if the student says, Mr. or Ms. Doctor, I have XYZ disability. So if they tell you that they have ADHD, they have a learning disability, you know, they have uh, multiple sclerosis, so if they actually give you a diagnosis, then you can refer them to the ADA office directly. Now, if a student seems to be struggling and they have not directly disclosed that they have a disability, then what you do is you create what I refer to as the ADA sandwich. You mention the ADA office, all the other helps that are available on campus, and then you mention the ADA office again. People remember the first things that they hear and the last things that they hear. So that's if the student has not directly disclosed a disability to you. There are confidential, confidentiality requirements that each of you will have if a student brings you that letter. So the letter will only have that they've been vetted by the office and that they qualify for certain dis uh, disability accommodations. So information that you might gain about a student's diagnosis or, or symptoms, those are to be kept confidential. Um, and don't share this information <coughs> unless it's on a need to know basis. And again, if you need to instruct others, um, and I usually talk about and give the example of um, some of our students who have uh, seizure disorders or epilepsy. They might have a 9 -1, call 911 in the case of an emergency written on their letter. So let's say that you're going to be out and you have a co-teacher who's coming <coughs> in. So you might want to alert the co-teacher. So that's what we mean by a verifiable need to know. Otherwise, you should communicate with the ADA advisor prior to disclosing other information. Your students who have disabilities are indeed special students. They are a special class of students. They are a protected class of students. So as such, their grievance process is outside, can be outside of the walls of the college. They have at their disposal the Office for Civil Rights. So they can file an Office of Civil Rights complaint or grievance related to disability discrimination or what they believe to be perceived disability discrimination. 
So the college's other uh, grievance procedures can be found in a number of places. Uh, in the faculty staff handbook as well as the student handbook and specifically in the ADA Disabled Student Services Handbook. Let's test your knowledge. So when you walk through the door, you are given a sheet of paper that has some scenarios on it. So these are some scenarios that are particularly common in this kind of work. So I'll read the scenario, we'll go through it and make sure that we know how to respond correctly. All right, so scenario one, a student in your class has presented you with an accommodation letter from the ADA office. While meeting with the student to discuss accommodations, you notice that the student has a hard time staying focused and seems easily distracted. You have a sister who has ADHD, and the student's behavior seems very familiar. You've learned a lot from your sister about strategies that are helpful, and you want to help this student too. Question, faculty. Is it appropriate to ask the student to disclose his or her disability so that you can provide additional support? Yeah. Excellent. Excellent. No, it's never okay to ask a student to disclose his or her disability. Actually, it's a violation of the law and their rights. So the best way you can assist a student with a disability is to provide the accommodations that are listed on the accommodation letter that you receive from the ADA office. Excellent work. Let's move along to scenario two. A student has registered for a lab course. The student is eligible for extended time on test and a reduced distraction testing environment. This poses a difficult situation as your lab is set up for a specified time just for the students to take the examination, which requires them to demonstrate specific skills that you have taught in the class. Students are allowed five minutes at each station to demonstrate the required skill. It's important that students are able to perform the skill within the specified amount of time. Question, faculty. Are you expected to change the format of this examination? I didn't hear from these people. So time and a half 
for multiple choice exams mm -hmm. and double time for essay or uh, exams that require calculations. Is that helpful? It is. Okay, great. So back to the scenario. Again, if your lab is to test time, you know, is time specific, then the answer you're definitely here is going to be no. All right. Let me ask you another question about time. <laughs> yes. Um, most of these, I know you talk about testing and things such as that. It's by the academic. I teach technical, and a lot of our our, a lot of our technical have daily projects we work on. Mm -hmm. uh, some have projects that last throughout this whole semester. So, how does extended time apply to those situations where there's a project has to be done within this day, within this class period? What is it a project that they work on independently? Sometimes. Okay. Then I would say that the best thing to do is to connect with Ms. P. Ryan to kind of find out what the expectations are. Mm -hmm. um, because it may not be practical for the student to have, um, depending upon what it is, to have extended time. Uh, I give the example of uh, my brother's the auto mechanic. You know, he, he can't spend you know, double time, you know, exactly. repairing an engine. Exactly. So you have to look at what's the industry standard for this particular uh, project or, or uh, with you being technical, I don't know where, you, is it air conditioning, I don't yeah, know, whatever the repair time just is. Just a task. A, a task. Mm -hmm. So what's the industry standard for finishing this task? Half the time. It's at half time. Half time. Half time. I always want to do it faster. Oh, okay, do it a little bit faster. <laughs> That's the industry standard. The industry yeah. standard. The typical industry standard. So is there like licensure that goes with this where they have to demonstrate? Okay. So again, I said troubleshoot with ADA advisor on a very specific thing like that. Was there another hand? Okay. Third scenario. Are we ready? Okay, a student in your class, Janet, is constantly falling asleep. She lays her head down on the desk and sometimes snores lightly. And this is very disruptive to you and the other students in the class. Janet gave you an accommodation memo at the beginning of the semester and informed you she is registered with the ADA office. You assume her sleeping in class is due to the disability or is perhaps a side effect of her medication, and you do not mention her, mention that her sleeping in class is a problem, and you try your best to ignore it. Question, faculty, do you have to accommodate disruptive behavior if the behavior is due to a documented disability? No. No. One more time. No. So students with disabilities are expected to abide by the code of conduct. Okay? And whatever the code of conduct is for this college, if they it, I'm sure it says you cannot sleep in class, right? Okay, you need to talk to Jen. So her disability letter is not to get out of jail free card. You know, talk to the student. You know, draw their attention to the fact that this is a code of conduct violation. And there is no protection for code of conduct violations. I have a question. Yes, ma'am. Is, is this uh, person specific? I mean, in this case, this is sleeping, but you said disruptive behavior. So what if you have someone who has a condition that may cause them to maybe speak out or harass? Correct. Yes. 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 Is that it? But we, we never know what they have, the though. <laughs> right? I mean, we don't. That's what I was saying, maybe. Okay, so sleeping. But like I said, that's why I said person specific. But sleeping is, that's something, you know. But would it depend on the condition? So, Let's, let's use the example that you use, Tourette's, okay? Not all Tourette's are the same, okay? They, 
it comes in, in very different fashions. Uh, and a lot of times, you know, those Tourette ticks are brought on by stress. So there may be something in the accommodation letter that would say, do not call on the student, or the student cannot speak in class. So um, there would be something in the letter to alert you to minimize the student's stress level. These are great questions. Um,